Hi, everybody, and welcome back to yet another cracking installment of the Secrets of Fail series, where we're shining a light on our ugly failures in business, you know, the stuff we don't want to talk about. And in the hot seat today to share his failures in business is none other than Robert Johnston, the CEO of Ad Lumen. Robert, welcome to the show, bud. Thanks, Matt. Really appreciate it. Oh, it's great to have you here, man. So I've had the chance to get to know you, but for our viewers around the world, uh, Rob, that uh, don't know about the amazing journey that, of scale that you guys have been on lately, uh, why don't you uh, give us the elevator pitch about uh, Ad Lumen? What are you guys up to? Yeah, absolutely. Ad Lumen is a, is a cybersecurity company where uh, we position ourselves as a command center for security operations built specifically for the channel. So... Um, we do a variety of security operations tasks for all of our uh, customers across the globe. Uh huh. So, what is a typical problem that you guys solve in the channel? Yeah, yeah. Uh, managed detection and response seems to be one of the most popular. Which you know, for those viewers out there that aren't completely uh, aware of MDR, like we find threats and we stop threats, right? Uh, that uh, on behalf of our customers in their networks, cloud environments, endpoint environments, whatever it may be. So that, that essentially responsibility and liability uh, comes over to our company uh, to, to find and stop threats as well as you know enhance their compliance posture, their readiness posture, conduct other security operations tasks for them like patching and scanning and penetration testing. Most of these are regulatory-driven, compliance-driven, but best practice-driven certainly as well. So, Robert, what is your story of fail for our audience around the world today? Yeah, the the story of Ad Lumen certainly is not always the story of success that a, a lot of people see today. I, I commonly say, and one thing I've learned is, in the beginning, success can look a lot like failure. In fact, it's it's strikingly similar to failure, and you know the the story of Ad Lumen was really I was an engineer by trade. And I just wanted to build cool technology, right? Uh, well, you know, cool technology doesn't necessarily line up to a big enough business problem, I, I think, in, in the private sector, a, as you might think, right? Just because you build interesting tech may not mean that you're solving enough problems for the customer uh, in order for him to be able to part, you know, with his hard-earned money. So, you know, in the early years, they were tough. We were building great technology, but I'm not sure we were really uh, approaching go to market in the right way, as well as, uh, you know, pointing our solution to significant, you know, business problems that customers had. And it took many years and many iterations and changes and expanding our view and broadening our vision in order to really hit our hit our stride. Uh, and then very quickly, in just a matter of like two years, you know, three years, your fortunes can really change. But it was, you know, it was a long, it was a long road prior to that, right? A long road of changing the business plan, changing the product, changing the target customer, changing how we went to market. And, and, you know, a lot of people don't either give themselves, I think enough runway or enough confidence to make it through that those initial very challenging years and and end up dying before that we were fortunate enough i think to to make it through so uh robert what did that experience of pivoting and changing and and you know building a better product changing your customer and that whole process and that experience what did that teach you yeah it taught me you know spend a little more time if you're an engineer right like like i was an engineer spend a little more time it sometimes is difficult for engineers trade engineers i think on the business problem, right? The why. There's a great book out there, you know, start with the why. I think uh, it's really important, right? You, you really need to line up your technology, whatever it is that you want to build to uh, a very real, very relevant uh, business problem. So, and just accomplish that first. The second thing is to spend a lot of time on deciding how you are going to bring your product to market. There are many templated ways to do that. No go to market is reinventing the wheel. You know, there are direct market motions, channel market motions, you know, marketplace motions. Like there are all sorts of ways to, to bring your products to customers, uh, but really spend some time and looking at 
who am I selling to? Okay. You know, what's my average contract value going to be? What's the price that I'm able to charge for this? And then, you know, decide on, on how you're going to go to market. A perfect example of this would be if your product costs $5 and you're trying to sell using a direct one-to-one business-to-business sales motion, it's never going to work and it's never going to sale scale, right? Because you have to hire enterprise sales representatives that are trying to approach enterprise companies and sell a product that costs five dollars. Like the the contract values just don't line up with the with the market motion, right? And so spend some time figuring out those two things first. If I had to look historically on uh, what would I have done differently, I would have spent a little more time on that as opposed to some cool widget we were building, right? So Rob, let's go back in time together. Uh, you kind of touched on it, but I'd like to unpack it a bit more. If you could go back in time, what would you do differently? Is, For example, is it really possible to get to your kind of scale without going through this pain of pivoting and changing customers and 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 and? and? That's, uh, that's hard to say. Look, people always say, oh, entrepreneurship, you're going to pivot at least twice. And maybe, and maybe this does hold true. I would, I wonder if, you know, sometimes in my head, like the, the folks that founded DocuSign, if they were off on some different path and then were like, oh, we're going to pivot to signing PDFs, you know, you know, I, I, I don't know the, the, the truth there, but it, many, many startups pivot. Yes. Many startups pivot. The less of that you have to do, the less pain you're going to feel. That's, that's a hundred percent true. Right. Um, if you nail, you know, if you nail the, the, the product and then you nail the go to the go to market in, in the beginning, the less pivoting you have to do, maybe you have to make slight changes and tweaks, but you don't have to maybe shift categories, right? Shifting categories is much harder. So, um, you know, that we, we ended up having to shift categories a couple of times and, you know, every time you do that, it's a, it's a painful motion. A lot of startup founders, entrepreneurs, probably engineers, definitely, definitely experience that multiple times. And that, and that's what separates, you know, the men from the boys, so, so to speak, right. Uh, you know, when the going gets tough, the tough get going and, and that's where you really start to pull away and, and those, you know, those begin to fail. And then those that, that find a way to kind of push through to success, despite, you know, the obstacles that they've pretty much created for themselves. Well, as they say, Robert, uh, startups don't die, founders quit. Yeah, yeah. And it, look, success looks a lot like failure, and many people maybe do quit too soon, right? Like uh, maybe they look and they're just, they're just thinking this isn't working, you know, and, and I should go do something different. And, and maybe they just didn't give themselves the opportunity to succeed because they quit too soon. But there's the other side of that too, right? Sticking with something too long that isn't working, right? And being and being too headstrong, probably too headstrong, too stubborn to not be willing to do a little self reflection and say, "Yeah, we got to make this isn't working. We got to make some changes, guys, right? And gals, right? Like we've got to make some fundamental changes here and and move in a different direction to get it working." Uh, those that are willing to do that and keep that open mind have a have a much better chance to success. Stubbornness, uh, I have found, uh, you know, doesn't really have a great place in in, in entrepreneurship. You can't be too stuck uh, in you know with your head in the sand, right? Mm. And neither does pride. I find, yeah. Pride. Like my dad, his pride, like you know, I'm I'm super aware of pride and the role that that plays in decision making, and pivoting or changing or recognizing or even just becoming self aware. Like, hey, your original. I mean, I've never start any business that I've scaled has never been the business that I set out to or, you know, to build. You know what I mean? Like, you think you're going to do this business? Like, no, dude, you're going to do that one, but you don't know what that one is. Yeah, and you don't know what that one is until the market tells you what that one is, right? And, and yeah, pride, pride can get, definitely get in the way of that. Right. And that kind of leads into, into, into stubbornness. And that's not to say you can't be proud of what you're doing, but you can't let your pride get in the way of what the customer really wants. And, you know, I've, uh, you know, I've, I've definitely done this in our business where I said, look, we're not here. 
like this is what the customer wants, we'll build it regardless of what I may think or my opinion is, right? As like it doesn't matter about my opinion. If he wants to make this disappear in this particular way, we're going to do it, right? And and, and that's cuz what what he wants. I'm not here to judge anybody or you know, tell anyone what to do. Like we're here to make the product do what the customer wants it to do, right? And, and whatever it takes to to do that, I, I'm not going to let you know, pride get in the way. So you do need to listen to your customer. Uh, you know, you can't let that go overboard, right? Um, because you could end up chasing your tail, right? And and chasing every little feature request that that comes along. And th- so there's a balancing act. But a- as an entrepreneur, you'll know, you'll know, and you'll be able to triage the truly important things with the nice to haves. And, and you just strike a nice balance and you end up with kind of a product and company evolution that just continues to grow and get better and get stronger. Yeah, it's this idea of if you give your customers what they want, you'll never give them what they need. That's right. That's right. You know, and it's a balance and um you know, you can't chase every feature request and it's impossible to deliver on every feature request, but uh you 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 do what you can and and um you make choices and you triage things and you and you recognize things even in advance that your customers don't yet know they want but you can tell just by the way the business is operating and the way the metrics are performing you can tell like this is a good idea like mm-hmm. the customers are going to want to buy this right or they're going to want this yeah. product and yeah. so you integrate it in what is your advice to your other CEOs, uh, Robert, when it come, well, in terms of the relationship with failure or the role of failure in success? Yep. First, you know, spend time making sure your product answers a really solid why. Second, make sure you spend some time on how you're going to bring that, that product in, into the marketplace. Um, but, you know, you need to focus on, on, on these two things. But also realize that you're going to hear a lot of no's, right? I mean, I've heard so many no's and so many, this is never going to work, you know, work over my years of doing this, that it doesn't even matter anymore. You know, um, we, we, we know what we're doing and we're going to keep doing it regardless of all the, all, you know, the negativity and the, and the negativity does definitely does come, especially in the early years. And you just got to find a way to overcome that. You know, it hurts there, the, it's like a roller coaster. There are so many highs and then there are so many lows. And then eventually things start going really, really well. And it does, it feels like all highs. It feels like you're just on top of the world. But every once in a while, something comes to, to drag you back down to earth and make you realize that the, the, the task is not yet complete, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and, and just keep reacting to that and stay the course. You know, there's all these stats out there. You know, X number of businesses fail in the first year. Uh, you know, of the subset of that, you know, most will fail by five years. And uh, of the subset of that, very few will break a hundred million in in enterprise value, like a tiny, tiny little fraction. And, and the odds are stacked against you a hundred percent against you. But I found, I think early, even in my military career, if you can just endure, you know, like if you can just endure and just stay in the game, you can take out 80, 85% of the competition just by enduring. And then by the time you've done that, then really you're only competing with that last 15%, right? And then you got to push the limit and then you got to push it, right? But just having endurance eliminates most of the competition. Such a great point, man. Tell me, uh, do you re- recommend any books or tools or resources that uh, other founders or entrepreneurs should be reading? Uh, to endure for argument's sake or just uh, good things to to read and consume in terms of getting perspective or anything really to help them on their journey? Yep, I, I recommend, you know, I would put it in almost phases, right? S- books like Start With a Why, you know, business value proposition books, like really coming up with a solid business plan in the early years, right? And then a- as your business matures and let's say you crack a million in revenue, that magic million, right? Once you crack that magic million, then you need to take a look and now you need to start talking about scaling, right? So books like Scale Up, uh, you know, are, are great. Then things really get professional at some point, probably around like 10 million, right? Things get really, really professional. And now you as an engineer CEO, you need to learn about 
quarterly business reviews, QBRs, and all these professional uh, sales organizations tasks that while you're not running because you have a sales executive by that time, you got to know about, right? And then, and then finally, books on accounting and finance, you know, at past that 10 million, right? Because then your job as CEO is to really measure and hold the business accountable to specific metrics because that's how you're graded. And it becomes, after 10 million, a, a science. It becomes a very, very big science, right? And, and everything is measured. And what, what doesn't get measured will never improve. And so you, you must really stay disciplined. And, and as you graduate over those, those years and kind of revenue milestones, you'll notice your company is, is becoming bigger and more professional and more measured. And, and that's what you want. And, and, and that's a good thing, but you got to change with it over time. And the books will change over time too. Mm -hmm. Such great advice. Uh, Robert, that concludes your time in the hot seat, buddy. Thanks for being on the show. Uh, you guys are scaling some ridiculous thing. I'm looking forward to your IPO. <laughs> <I want that laughs> soon. Thanks. Um, and uh, yeah, man, thanks for being on the show. I uh, appreciate it, man.